This presentation covers blood pressure, how it works, and diseases associated with it. Blood pressure is the strength of your blood pushing against the sides of your blood vessels. The formula for blood pressure is CO times TPR. CO is cardiac output and it's equivalent to HR times SV. HR is heart rate, SV is stroke volume, and TPR is total peripheral resistance. Cardiac output is the volume of blood pumped by the left ventricle in one minute and it's a product of two factors, your heart rate and your stroke volume. So the formula for cardiac output is HR heart rate times SV stroke volume. Heart rate and stroke volume are two very important factors in blood pressure. Your heart rate is the number of times your heart beats each minute and your stroke volume is the volume of blood pumped with each ventricular contraction. So what might you see as a typical value for cardiac output? An average heartbeat is somewhere around 75 beats a minute. Stroke volume on the average is about 0 0.07 liters per beat or 70 milliliters per beat. So if we plug those into the formula cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume, cardiac output equals 75 beats a minute times 0 0.07 liters per beat and cardiac output then would be equivalent to 5.25 liters per minute. How might the cardiac output of a healthy, well-conditioned person be different? Well, typical values for heart rate and stroke volume in a healthy conditioned person might be 200 beats a minute and 0 0.150 liters per beat. Again, if we plug that into the formula, cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. Cardiac output equals 200 beats per minute times 0 0.150 liters per beat, and that's 30 liters per minute. There are three main factors that control blood pressure. They are the autonomic nervous system, or ANS, secretions of the adrenal medulla, and the rate of venous return, and we're going to talk about each of these. The autonomic nervous system has control over unconscious processes like the heartbeat, breathing, and digestive processes. The autonomic nervous system, or the ANS, is divided into the sympathetic nervous system, the SNS, and the parasympathetic nervous system, PNS. You studied the autonomic nervous system last semester. Let's look at how the SNS and PNS differ from one another. The SNS secretes a neurotransmitter known as norepinephrine or noradrenaline. Norepinephrine plays a role in stress control. The PNS secretes a neurotransmitter known as ACH or acetylcholine. The effect of norepinephrine is to increase heart rate and stroke volume. The effect of acetylcholine is to decrease heart rate and stroke volume. So how do the sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system relate to cardiac output and blood pressure? Well, remember the formula for blood pressure and for cardiac output. So blood pressure is heart rate times stroke volume times TPR. Remember that the SNS increases heart rate and stroke volume and the PNS decreases heart rate and stroke volume. What would you think would happen to the blood pressure under the influence of the SNS versus the influence of the PNS? Well, the answer is as heart rate and stroke volume increase, so does blood pressure. And this is the sympathetic nervous system. As heart rate and stroke volume decrease, so does blood pressure, and this is the parasympathetic nervous system. The second factor that's important in blood pressure is the secretions of the adrenal medulla. Epinephrine and norepinephrine, also known as adrenaline and noradrenaline, are secretions of the adrenal medulla and both increase stroke volume and heart rate. So how does this affect blood pressure? Again, go back to your blood pressure formula. Blood pressure equals heart rate times stroke volume times TPR. So if you increase stroke volume or heart rate or both, that would increase blood pressure. Please be sure that you learn all the formulas in this presentation. The third factor affecting blood pressure is the rate of venous return. There's a law that explains this. It's called Frank Starling's Law and it says, the more you stretch cardiac muscle, the more forcefully it will contract. And it's this force that causes more blood to be moved out of the left ventricle and returns more blood to the heart. This is called venous return. What do you think would increase venous return? We'll talk about that on the next slide. 
One thing that will increase the rate of venous return is exercise. Inhalation will increase the rate of venous return as well. Elevation of the lower extremities also increases venous return. So here's what that means. If we increase venous return, we stretch the left ventricle more and it pumps harder. This increases the stroke volume, which increases blood pressure. Take a look at your formula below. One other factor that plays a role in blood pressure is TPR or total peripheral resistance and this is the resistance to blood flow through the vessels. As peripheral resistance increases, blood pressure increases. Again, you should be able to see that if you look at the formula below. To recap, there are three factors that affect blood pressure. They are heart rate, stroke volume, and peripheral resistance. As the heart rate increases, so does blood pressure. As volume increases, so does blood pressure. And as resistance increases, so does blood pressure. We have built-in automatic devices that monitor blood pressure. They are known as the baroreceptors and they're located in the aortic arch and the carotid sinus. They respond to the stretching of the arterial walls. So how does this work? Well, as blood pressure increases, the large arteries stretch and it sends a signal to the baroreceptors. The baroreceptors respond by sending out an increased number of action potentials. This will alert the medulla and the vasomotor center and cardiac center will respond. The vasomotor center increases the diameter of blood vessels and this means that there will be a decrease in venous return and a decrease in peripheral resistance. The cardiac center will slow the heart rate and make the contraction less forceful. All of these factors help to bring blood pressure back to normal. Let's look at some blood pressure values. Normal blood pressure is defined as 120 millimeters of mercury over 80 millimeters of mercury. The top number, the 120, is the systolic pressure, and the bottom number, the 80, is the diastolic pressure. High blood pressure is defined as any sustained pressure greater than 140 over 90. Low blood pressure does not have a number associated with it. Instead, it's defined as decreased tissue perfusion followed by organ dysfunction. When measuring a person's blood pressure, it's important to take three consecutive readings at least one or two minutes apart. Hypotension is defined as low blood pressure. The prefix hypo means low or underneath or below, and it can lead to poor tissue perfusion. There are a number of different causes of hypotension. They include dehydration, which is the loss of fluid, hemorrhage, which is the loss of blood, poor nutrition, and that usually means too little blood protein. Anaphylaxis, drugs and bee stings can release histamines and this causes vasodilation and postural changes. Let's talk for just a minute about postural changes. When you stand up, your blood pressure drops. This is known as orthostatic hypotension. If you want to prevent it, you could do exercises and that's very helpful. The stick figures at the bottom of this slide show you some of the exercises that are good for that. We do know that more strokes occur right before awakening because a person's blood pressure is highest at this time. When you arise in the morning, your blood moves to different areas of the body. If you arise too quickly, you may begin to feel dizzy. This is orthostatic hypotension. Symptoms of hypotension include dizziness and fainting, blackouts, and coma. So how do you treat hypotension or increase the blood pressure? You can do that by increasing your salt intake because this causes fluids to be retained, which raises blood pressure. Force fluids, blood transfusions, both of those will increase the fluid in your blood system and cause the blood pressure to rise. Vasoconstrictors, which make the vessel smaller and that increases pressure. IV fluids, again, to increase the volume in your blood. NSAIDs, things like naproxen, Motrin, Feldene, all of these cause salt retention and cause you to retain water. NSAIDs are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Hypertension means high blood pressure. Hyper means greater than or above. It's known as a silent killer because you cannot feel high blood pressure. In most cases, the cause of high blood pressure is unknown, but very often people with hypertension have an increased TPR, total peripheral resistance. A number of factors contribute to high blood pressure. Diet is one of those factors. For example, a high salt intake, more than 1,500 milligrams a day, can raise blood pressure. 
Obesity can lead to many problems, including higher blood pressure. It's harder for the heart to pump blood through the rest of the tissues in the body when a person is severely overweight. Heredity. High blood pressure is more common in males than females, and high blood pressure is more common in black males than white males. Stress. As stress levels rise, so does blood level cholesterol. What are some things you can do to treat hypertension? Decrease salt because salt causes water retention. Lose weight. This decreases the resistance since there's less tissue to perfuse. Exercise which dilates the vessels and drops blood pressure. Stop smoking because smoking causes arteries to clog and leads to high blood pressure. And there are certain medications. Common meds include things like diuretics, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, vasodilators, and calcium channel blockers. Here's a list of some of the groups of medications used to treat hypertension. Diuretics, which increase water loss, an example is Lasix. Beta blockers, which decrease heart rate and stroke volume, and an example is Enderol. ACE inhibitors, block an enzyme that causes blood vessels to constrict, low tensin. Mesodilators increase blood vessel diameter. An example is nitroglycerin. By increasing blood vessel diameter, you drop the blood pressure. Calcium channel blockers that relax blood vessels and increase the supply of blood and oxygen to the heart. Norvasc is a calcium channel blocker. Problem with most of these medications is some can lead to impotence and men stop taking them. This is known as noncompliance. The definition of shock is dangerously low tissue perfusion, so the blood's not getting to all parts of the body that need it. There are several causes of shock, including severe hemorrhage, severe dehydration, and severe anaphylaxis. There's a short video on shock that you may want to watch. Symptoms of shock include a rapid heart rate, and the reason why the heart rate increases is to compensate for low blood pressure. Remember, if the blood pressure is low, Increasing heart rate, stroke volume, or total peripheral resistance will increase blood pressure. Also, there's a weak pulse, and the reason why is because the blood volume is very low. If a person is in shock, you want to lay them down and elevate their feet about 12 inches if they've had no neck or back injury. Be sure to keep the person warm, call 911 right away, and then begin CPR if necessary. Blood flow through the tissues is known as tissue perfusion. Because there's a limited blood supply, all organs of the body cannot be supplied at the right time, so we want to be sure that we get blood to the places it's needed at the time it's needed. Two important factors to consider are the velocity of blood flow and the autoregulation of blood flow, and that's a type of local regulation. Velocity of blood flow is a measure of how fast the blood flows through the blood vessels, a very important concept to recognize is the velocity of blood flow is inversely related to the total cross-sectional area of the vessels to be filled. We'll look at that in the next slide. Capillaries are very small, but there are many of them and so their total cross-sectional area is very large. This means that the velocity of blood flow through the capillaries will be slow. And the reason this is important is it will allow time for the exchange of nutrients and wastes between the blood and tissues. Besides the velocity of blood flow, the autoregulation of blood flow is also an important factor in tissue perfusion. The autoregulation of blood flow is the automatic adjustment of blood flow in each tissue on demand. That means as a tissue needs oxygen, it's able to regulate the flow of blood. What causes vessels to dilate and beds to open in active tissues? There are three important factors. A decrease in oxygen in the tissues, an increase in carbon dioxide in the tissues, and a decrease in pH in the tissues. All of those relax smooth muscle and the valve will open and allow blood into the tissues that need the oxygen. This process is known as active hyperemia.